Hey everyone, good afternoon. Just wait another few minutes, but I think we officially have quorum. Um, can everyone hear me, by the way? This is Lily Kajabi. Um, thanks, great to be here. I just wanted to let everyone know I have a conflict that I was not a, I can't reconcile, so I'm gonna have to drop off at five minutes to 11. And so just so you know if I disappear, I, I'll be watching the videos later when they're posted to take in the whole meeting. Thank you. Lily, I think we are just waiting for, oh, I think. Good morning, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Great, great. There's no video yet, but we can hear you. Okay, let me see if I can get that to activate. Where am I here? Disable video, add video. It's telling me my video is on. It looks like from our end the video is on too, but it's totally black. Hey, I think I'm there now. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, we officially have quorum, um, and we can call the meeting to order. Um, and because we have no co-chair yet, but we will elect a co-chair, um, I will help facilitate the meeting in the beginning. Um, and uh, you know, once we, begin, we can proceed. So, Uh, did you want to say anything? No, sorry, I'll mute my oh. mic. Okay, no problem. Um, well, good morning, everyone. I will officially call the meeting of the State and Local Racial and Identity Profiling Policies Subcommittee to order um, and welcome everyone. Uh, with love to go around and do introductions um, of the board members. And we'll just ask throughout the meeting for um, everyone to keep their microphones and videos muted, um, except for board members. Um, and then during the public comment period, you, ha you will have a chance um, to make public comment either on video um, or just audio. Um, and also, the anything that's in the chat, we do monitor the chat, um, but please save your comments that you want in the public record um, for the public comment period that will be at the end. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Elgard. I'm the Deputy Attorney General with the Civil Rights Enforcement Section of the Attorney General's Office. Uh, welcoming all of you to the meeting. Um, and we'd love to have the members of the board uh, go around and introduce yourselves. Um, I'll just start with my top left, even though it may be different from others, but Felicia, you are on my top left of my screen. Good morning, everybody. Felicia Espinosa, I'm here on behalf of Root and Rebound. Root and Rebound um, is a legal nonprofit that helps with all, with system impacted people and all the legal barriers that uh, impact them after the criminal justice system, so housing, employment, family regulation systems, um, and the 48,000 legal barriers that accompany arrest records and convictions. Um, I'm housed and lead our Central Valley work, 
we focus on system impacted women um, and specifically women of color with the barriers that they're facing. I'm happy to be here and passing it to Melanie. Hi, Melanie Ochoa. I'm a senior staff attorney with ACLU of Southern California, focusing on police practices and criminal justice. Um, and I will popcorn it over to oh. Lily. Lily, you're muted. I apologize. It it wouldn't be a remote meeting if I hadn't done that. Um, thank you. Um, I'm thank you for that. I'm Lily Kajavi. I'm a professor of mathematics in, um, in at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, and apparently still a novice blue jeans um, web app user. And um, I'm very interested in uh, issues that have a, a policy perspective, but a quantitative focus, and in particular, it's use of what I'll call mathematics for social justice. Um, and I've had a focus on on policing and looking at the LAPD in particular um, around traffic stops and other um, other aspects of, of policing or the LAPD. Um, and I'm new to this particular subcommittee, um, and so I'm very I'm very pleased to be here. I think it's going to be a I hope we'll be doing critical work this year towards um, towards the work of the board and um, the reports and recommendations that are made. Thank you. I'll pass it on um, to Steve. Hi everyone, uh, Steve Raphael, I'm professor of public policy at UC Berkeley, and I've uh, I'm longtime uh, criminal justice um, researcher, uh, doing lots of lots of work in California on various aspects of corrections and policing and prosecutions and all sorts of things. And I'm also new to the committee, so I'm really looking forward to today's session and to working uh, with this committee over the course of the year, subcommittee over the course of the year. Thanks. Commissioner Ray, you're, you're up. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, I'm Amanda Ray. I, um, in November, I became the commissioner of the California Highway Patrol, and I am also new to the board, but very excited to be here and to work with each and every one of you. Uh, go Bears to Steve, um, also a Cal alum, but um, I, I'm really just looking forward to um, working and having the CHP be a part of of this discussion and what we're, what we're trying to accomplish here. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, now we will move to the approval of the September 30th, 2020 subcommittee meeting minutes. Um, so is there a motion to approve the minutes? Melanie, I move to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I was and I should. Okay, great, thank you. And I should ask: Did anyone have any comments or edits or feedback before we made the motion? I should have asked that sooner. Um, sounds like nobody does. Okay, great. Um, so Melanie motioned, Amanda seconded. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Aye. Sorry, Lily, that was oh, for sorry, that in was favor. A, that was an I, sorry, in okay. favor. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so all, all in favor, no opposed and no abstentions. So great, thank you. Um, and just um, so everybody knows the meeting materials, um, uh, Anna was kind enough to link them in the chat. Um, so they are there and they're also available for those of you um, who aren't on um, the Blue Jeans video on the REPA website. Um, so thank you everyone. So the minutes are approved. And now we will move on to the election of the subcommittee co-chairs. Um, so does anyone want to make a nomination for a co-chair? This is Melanie. I would like to nominate Felicia. I second the nomination. Alicia, um, so wonderful. We have a nomination and a second for Felicia. And are there any other nominations for co-chair? Okay, 
Well, for right now, <laughs> we, we can have one chair for now and um, we may ask um, if others want to co-chair a little later on. I know a lot of people are new to this subcommittee, um, but then there's been a motion um, and a second for Felicia. Um, so we should have a vote on Felicia as chair. Um, all those in favor? I guess we should do a roll call. So everybody is in, in favor. <laughs> Wonderful. So Felicia, welcome to the chair <laughs> um, of the policy subcommittee. And since this is your first meeting, um, I'm happy to help you facilitate um, as we move forward. But you and I can um, go back and forth a little bit for the agenda. But we're we're grateful to have you as chair. And um, if others are interested um, in co-chairing the subcommittee as the meetings, as the year goes on, and as you get more into the meetings, um, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I, I, I hate to be Debbie Downer here, but technically we need to do a roll call, even though it's unanimous, but I, I because we're not in person, we need to do a roll call. Sorry. Thank you, Nancy. No, I, I, I had that thought. I had the fleeting thought, so I should have followed that. So, um, Melanie, your your vote. Okay, Melanie's aye. Um, Amanda. Aye. Lily. Aye. Steve. Aye. Felicia. Aye. Wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations thank you, again. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. Looking forward to it. And feel free to be a co-chair and nominate yourself. Contact us. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so now we would like to have a discussion um, of the proposed subcommittee work. Um, and Felicia, you and I can co-facilitate this, but, um, you know, a big purpose of this meeting um, is to really think about the work of this subcommittee and how you would like to move forward um, with the report this year um, and what areas of um, you are interested in pursuing. So we, we do have some DOJ um, short presentations um, just on topics that uh, were either um, raised by the subcommittee last year or that came up because of some of the, um, what the data is showing, um, some of the discussions in the subcommittee and others. Um, so first I will turn it over to Dominique, I believe, um, to talk about uh, the bias-free policing matrix and the future approach um, with this topic. Thanks, Allison. Can you all hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm also going to talk about um, the accountability systems that this subcommittee sort of uh, started on last year. And I know we have a few new people on the subcommittee, so I'm going to go through um, some of the materials that we attached to the meeting notice. Um, and it's basically an excerpt from last year's report. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay, I think I'm yeah. seeing some nods. Okay, wonderful. All right, um, so what basically what happened, um, I guess to catch you all up to speed here, um, the subcommittee wanted to look into model policies surrounding accountability. Um, and what happened through the research is there isn't necessarily a one single model policy that can really uh, encompass all of the accountability systems or measures that are required to ensure accountability in police um, agencies or law enforcement agencies. So the board came up with um, sort of a few categories that make up the different accountability system. And those categories are listed here. Um, they are 10 different ones. So we have data tracking and transparency, early intervention systems, video technology, supervisory oversight, clear policies and pathways, misconduct complaints, discipline, community-based accountability, recruitment, hiring, and promotions, and performance evaluations. Now, the board gave a sort of an overview in, the la in this year's report, the, 2020, the 2021 report, um, and those are detailed below. So we'll go through a little bit of that. 
But what I want to say from the outset is the, um, policy, the policy subcommittee did not focus on early intervention systems because the civilian complaints subcommittee sort of took that on um, in their review and especially looking into how the civilian complaints um, are used in an early intervention warning system. Um, and this year they'll be looking at that and the effectiveness of early intervention systems. Um, but the other sort of areas are kind of open for you all to choose and discuss about what we want to focus on this year. And, you know, we want to think about how much time and uh, resources we have to cover some of these topics. Some of them are a little bit, I guess, shorter to go through than some others, um, but it really depends on what you all want to focus on this year. So with respect to data tracking and transparency, um, specifically what the board detailed in the report, um, is that they will explore how data can be used for oversight of indiv individual officers, first-line supervisors, or entire precincts and units. That's very broad, um, but that is something that we can look into if you all want to focus on this. An additional piece that you all may want to consider for data tracking and transparency is maybe looking at um, specifically RIPA stop data uh, transparency or accountability. Um, I know that that has been a topic that has come up in this subcommittee and others as well, um, but that may be something that you will want to look at. Uh, I'm going to skip early intervention warning systems. Um, then we have video technology and essentially what this section focuses on or focused on um, before was thinking about body-worn cameras or other types of video technology that police use in interactions with individuals. And um, this section also looked at the OIG report that was written last year about LAPD's uh, RIPA stop data. So looking at this section would probably entail reviewing maybe the effectiveness of body-worn cameras um, on, say, use of force, or generally looking at how law enforcement should be utilizing the videos that come from these data or from these technologies in their accountability of officer interactions um, day to day. So then we have uh, supervisory oversight, which um, is pretty broad because it includes supervisory oversight of first line officers and also supervisory oversight of command staff, making sure that there is supervision at every level. Um, here the board sort of detailed specifically, and I'm sorry, I'm using two separate screens, so um, forgive me for looking away. But um, here specifically, the board detailed a variety of very specific, um, but at the same time broad because they require a lot of research into these different areas. Um, looking at uh, supervisor training, looking at how supervisors are, um, I guess like how policies specifically detail how supervisors should conduct their oversight. Um, specifically with, uh, you know, when something happens, how an officer, I'm sorry, how a supervisor responds or how um, proactive a supervisor might need to be with their supervision. Um, this section, I will say part of it is also in some ways covered by early intervention systems because part of the discussion in the 2021 report about early intervention systems is talking about how these systems really require robust supervision or proactive supervision and it talks a little bit about the type of supervision that's required and i think it may be something that in this year's report the civilian complaint subcommittee will also talk more about um, given their interest in looking at early intervention systems but this can be also something that this subcommittee may want to look at um, the next section is clear policies and pathways and this is one that's a little bit more broad um, than some of the others, but it's specifically talking about clear policies within an agency that prohibit racial and identity profiling, which many of them already have a, you know, explicit statement um, in their bias policing policies, as we've seen in our matrix review. Um, but there may be other ways in which uh, the board wants to uh, recommend that there be more clear policies or pathways, um, sorry, policies specifically on prohibiting racial and identity profiling. The pathways piece is really focusing on how to, um, I would say, encourage or overcome a little bit of this blue coat of silence when it comes to, um, you know, bringing up that another officer has engaged in some kind of discriminatory um, action. 
so that may be something that this uh, uh, sorry subcommittee wants to look at in this coming year. So that's here where we say looking at pathways for officers to report peers behavior. Next we have, oh, this is delayed a little. Okay. Next we have a uh, misconduct complaint. And this is really looking at complaints from um, folks in the community about uh, officer misconduct. And specifically the board here did, did detail some um, specific ways that they would want to review um, the misconduct complaint process. And this also could be related to civilian complaints. And I will say that the civilian complaint committee has not, uh, sorry, subcommittee, has not reviewed procedures of civilian complaints, say investigations. They've only looked at the forms so far. They may potentially look at the procedures of civilian complaint investigations in the future. And we know that civilian complaints aren't the only ways that investigations happen, right? That could come from uh, invest, uh, internal affairs as well. But that may be something that they may cover, just so you all know when you're thinking about what resources you want to put into this year versus next year, say. And the next section that we have is discipline policies. And really what this section sort of focused on is thinking about how um, memorandums of understanding with police unions have affected or currently affect um, an agency's ability to discipline or how they discipline. Um, and it also focused on thinking about ensuring that there are policies that provide very clear understanding to um, officers about what types of discipline they could expect based on what kind of behavior, or I'm sorry, what kind of misconduct they engage in. And um, specifically, this also could relate to um, looking into and recommending best practices around the types of discipline for the type of misconduct. So I think um, board member Ochoa brought this up last year, thinking about how potentially in some agencies, an officer may have a greater or more harsh discipline for not coming for um, using a sick day when they weren't actually sick or something of that nature versus the kind of discipline they may receive for um, an excessive use of force. So that may be something that this subcommittee wants to focus on for this coming year. The next piece that you all may want to consider is thinking about community-based accountability. And this section really focused on thinking about uh, civilian review boards or civilian oversight commissions. Um, and also looking at something that has been used by the US DOJ in their consent decrees, which are community surveys, which essentially are trying to get the community's input on um, the way that they're treated by the um, law enforcement in their community, what they want to see, what the perception is. Um, and I think that that we have, if you all wanted to focus on that, for example, we have those examples used in um, US DOJ consent decrees with other agencies around uh, what, what makes the best sort of community survey. Now we also have recruitment, hiring, and promotion, and this also covers a broad variety of um, pieces. As you can see here in the second paragraph, there are very specific items like how um, agencies recruit, what kind of uh, team they have, what they look for, how they do the recruiting, um, are some specific things that were considered to potentially look to into the future. Um, but I want to say that recruitment, hiring, and promotions, part of that may also be covered in this year or next year or coming year's reports through the post subcommittee, which also focuses on recruitment and hiring um, in law enforcement. And uh, that there's a few, or there was a just a small start of that in the 2021 report um, that we intend to build on for the uh, coming year. The last piece um, of the accountability system that you all may want to consider for us to look into um, in this year's report is performance evaluation. And so this really focuses on thinking about how, what kind of best practices or recommendations the board would want to make as far as what performance evaluations consider. So traditionally they focused on police activity such as arrests or um, you know, interactions with getting quote unquote criminals off the street um, versus maybe 
looking at how many commendations has this person received? How good are they at de-escalating situations? Um, and so this would be focusing on sort of changing almost uh, the picture or the assessment of an officer on the field. So that's kind of the different areas that we had focused on um, or sort of come to last year on this uh, subcommittee. There are definitely probably other areas of accountability that you all may have an interest in um, that you may want to bring up, but we just want to kind of get an idea of what you all want us to sort of focus our resources on um, for the 2022 uh, RIPA report with respect to accountability. So I'll open up the floor to the board members for you to discuss. You can also ask me questions if that would be helpful. So I have a, a few questions, Dominique. And I, so I know just looking at the agenda, it mentions there's like three bullet points, um, the bias of policing matrix and consent and supervision stops and model policy and best practices. Is this going to only one of those things? Because I don't know that like consent searches and discretionary searches were discussed in what you were laying out. Are these are those separate questions about what we want to engage in versus kind of dealing with this first? Yeah. Yes, they're separate. Okay. They're separate pieces. So this is one piece of you of the policies section of the report, but we will be discussing others as well, just like the matrix. Okay. And this is, in general, is is the way that we would approach these different questions potentially vary, or is this all going to be kind of self-reports from the agency of like, what are you guys doing on like X, Y, Z thing that we're asking about? Or are we actually going to do any other kind of, is, are we, do we have the capacity to do any other type of investigation into what, in terms of what's actually going on at the agency level? So I would say, it, you know, this would, it's pretty open in the sense that we would do some literature review, for example, of some things that are already out there. If there were questions that you all wanted to ask agencies, that could be something you could do as well. Um, I don't know that there are any specific limitations that I'm aware of at this time as far as what you all can do in your review, but essentially it's kind of what you all think will help us get to the point of you all being able to make recommendations on policy with respect to bias-free policing and accountability. So okay, so I'll just flag some of the things that were super interesting to me in terms of what I would love to see based on what we went through just now. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things uh, on, on like the identifying canned language and how they're determining what if there's actually identifying for justifications for stops, et cetera, and searches. I would be really interested in learning more about that. I'm not sure how we would measure that exactly or what type of investigation would actually get to agencies actually, or supervisors or agencies actually ensuring that their, their officers are not just resorting to furtive movements and you know the kind of standard canned things and are actually um, observing kind of particularized conduct that justifies suspicion, but that's kind of almost the crux of a lot of the RIPA data that is being collected and is identifying this basis for these stops. So to the extent there's any further investigation on that, that would be something I would love to see, although I'm not sure exactly what that would look like to be able to actually identify it. Um, in terms of um, data tracking, I would love to see how um, body cam audits are included in any of these different types of supervisory review, including um, validation of RIPA data or any of these other things uh, that are kind of self-reported by officers to really identify what's going on, um, how many agencies have body cams and how many are using them, and kind of a, a routine part of figuring out what was actually going on on the streets and how many of them are then incorporating that into disciplinary practices. So there's even with like that OIG report, they picked up a lot of dis discrepancies between what the officers are reporting on paper and what's happening, but that didn't get translated to my best uh, to my best understanding into any discipline for officers where that's identified. It's just kind of like, hey, look, what, this is what we saw. Um, mm -hmm. No real next steps on that. Um, the issue on recruiting and hiring, um, particularly the the comment or the suggestion on like reviewing social media and looking for hate group ties. I believe that that's also tied to a new statute that was enacted last year. And I, I think Allison can correct me or, or interject with that or, or Nancy, because we were discussing it. But I would like to see how um, 
agencies have responded to that um, and adopting actual practices for screening for those things, because as we talked a lot about this last year, um, that is a, a like more about the explicit racism and explicit bias that's happening in agencies. And so how are they taking steps to address that, identify it, um, weed it out, both in the initial hiring practices, but also throughout um, any like, continuing performance evaluations or things like that. Um, the compl I'm, for the, the information that we have on complaints, is that all civilian complaints and not internally generated complaints currently that we are, are that's being reported? That's being reported to DOJ? Yeah, is that only for civilian complaints, but not like like kind of as you were talking about the pathways for officers to file complaints against themselves or supervisors generating, you know, internal investigations on things? Yeah, my understanding, and, and someone else may, may correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is those are just the complaints submitted by civilians, so nothing I, I, in turn. I would love to see more information about report uh, complaints that are or in, internal investigations, kind of how exactly they care, categorize these things being generated internally, whether it's from office, like officers having seen something or superiors, um, you know, writing up their, their, you know, supervisees for different conduct, because my understanding is that the internally generated complaints are much more likely to be sustained and results in discipline. So if we're thinking about the discipline that's actually going on within agencies, that's going to be where most of that is com coming from. So I would love to mm -hmm. see kind of the patterns in that. Um, I think those are my, oh yeah, and then I definitely was, I, I, I like the idea about looking at the performance evaluations and particularly to the extent we can suggest other measures to gauge performance that validate the kind of behavior that we want to see. Um, mm -hmm. And I think those are the main things that I was really excited about based on the list that you went through. So thank you very much. Yeah, of course. And I will, I, I want to hear more board members uh, feedback as well, but I do want to say um, it would be helpful if, I, I don't know if folks want to choose like one or two areas specifically, or if we want to choose sort of these different, very specific items in multiple areas, it would be helpful to know for us if that's sort of, or how, how you all want to go forward with that. Go ahead, Steve. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you for the, for the presentation, Dominique. Um, I, I said a couple of quick comments. So one was in the Stop Data Subcommittee the other day. The um, there was also support expressed for looking into um, body worn cameras, the information that's revealed, what departments have them, how they're using them, and then also the the comparison of of what we can learn from them relative to what's in the RIPA data. The, the one thing I, I thought was interesting and might might be worth elevating a little bit for the purposes of providing model and information is um, the the same statistician researcher that developed the the veil of darkness um, test that we use to sort of summarize the data also has um, sort of innovated in the area of internal benchmarking officer specific outcomes. And they, there's a, a couple of, of well-known papers, and it's an active area of research where uh, basically within departments, one can generate a benchmark set of outcomes for any officer based on their assignment and their shifts and what, what reporting district they cover and that sort of thing. And then you can see how much of an outlier someone is along whatever outcome you're, you're, at, you know, you're interested in. And so that, you know, if, if it, I mean, this dovetails nicely into early warning systems and thinking about mm -hmm. internally okay. generated complaints and all those sorts of things because it's just basically a statistical management tool. So I, I don't think the RIPA data as, as currently constituted uh, could be used to do this, but, but I think internal data that departments have can. And so that, that might be something worth, worth looking into. Do any other board members have feedback or 
questions response to interests of this year. Thank you, Dominique. Um, I did have, so just following up on the, and, and I know Post might be looking into this, like the recruitment and promotions. Um, I'm very interested in not just uh, in focusing more on the internal promotions. Um, I know like change of leadership, having people of color um, at that level and at decision making um, level is important in addition to just the recruitment of new uh, potential police force especially when it comes to like the social media recruitment, as we learned, if we're just doing that for potential um, recruits, that's very different than who is really um, affected and the difference in the shift that happens once you become part of the police force. Um, so we can look into whether there are background investigators when it comes to internal promotions, um, when it comes to internal um, assignments within a uh, task force or internal assignments within what part of the community you're policing. Um, that would be interested, what use is that of that background investigators? Um, I'm also interested, in, and I know it hasn't been mentioned yet, is in the community-based accountability. So how, how are we, and if possible, I know this is more policy-based, um, what, what police departments are including the community when it comes to either having a board that rec um, looks over discipline, looks over uh, recruitment, looks over promotions, and also even if they do, is it meaningful? So if, if it is that it's possible, kind of going back to Melanie in terms of can we have some investigation or is it just literature review? I think it's important, especially when it comes to like the community-based accountability, it may be on paper, but if you actually ask the community, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's cursory, it's, it's on paper only. So if that is possible to do a more in-depth analysis when it comes to that. Do, do uh, board member Ray or board member Kajabi have any feedback on this particular piece? This is board member Kajabi, Lily Kajabi. I, I just wanted to say that was very rich. I, I appreciate all the suggestions and items that are highlighted. Um, Melanie Shaw gave us a very rich list and I appreciated also Steve and Felicia added. And so I don't have additional areas. I was going to say that um, to the extent that uh, if there's an intersection with the the data subcommittee or other initiatives, I don't know if that I don't know if that will make it harder for the work to progress or amplify, you know, accelerate what we can do to join forces. Maybe that's most relevant in something Melanie mentioned that I think we'll swing back to looking at, um, for example, consent use of consent mm -hmm. in in searches. Um, um, but I don't I, of all the topics that are mentioned, I don't I don't have additional ones. To add, the other thought I had is that even though we have these very important broad 10 subcategories, even if we're not focusing on particular ones, but have narrower questions within each one along the lines of what all the board members thus far have raised, that might be a way to, to for us to make practically make progress without it. There just being so many, so many pieces that we can't move forward. So narrow questions within a number of areas as opposed to focusing on on one or two of these areas might be an approach. Okay. And I think from my perspective, um, I, I really, I, I, I like a lot of the ideas that were presented. And I think all of these categories have some value. And I think that there are some lessons to be learned and things to, to be able to dig into. So I think I'm listening and I'm going, well, hey, I think any of these areas would be good for us to look into. So. But I do think narrowing the, the scope would be a lot easier so that we can actually make sure that we can we can come up with some type of topics that could be realistically looked into, you know, that are too broad. So I think maybe we can narrow this. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I really appreciate everybody's feedback. And I just want to say from what I've heard, um, I think that, I mean, I've heard multiple times uh, the stuff about body-worn cameras, and I think wanting to get an understanding of what agencies currently do or currently have um, with respect to body-worn cameras and potentially um, community oversight of, um, of law enforcement services. And um, Melanie, you mentioned a lot of great things, and I just want to, I just want to, um, 
I guess see if we can if we can maybe pick a few that um, we want to get started with. And I think also I'm, I'm asking if you all want us to ask uh, maybe the current agencies, so wave one, two, and three, um, or if you want us to do, I guess, yeah, say like not a survey necessarily, but in my communication with them for the matrices, I could potentially also ask them questions related to body worn camera footage, I'm sorry, body worn camera usage um, or policies around uh, community involvement, uh, if that's something that you all want us to engage in. And this is Felicia. In reviewing the um, notes, and this is my first meeting here, but I, in reviewing the notes from last year, what I thought um, was interesting was the idea of having more meaningful surveys, be it um, versus depth for DOJ, right? Asking all of wave one, two, and three, which may be in terms of capacity and issue, um, having an anonymous or deciding on some and focusing in on um, a couple of those LEAs, right? To be able to have a little bit more in terms of capacity um, and having more in-depth um, surveys, especially in terms of how much DOJ is limited in terms of the one, two, three waves, um, but that might be an option too. That's definitely a fair point. And um, I will say that part of the survey that we did last year did ask about um, civilian oversight boards. And I believe we included a, uh, a piece in the 2020, 2021 report about how many agencies that included. And it, uh, I can't remember what the number was. So I don't want to misspeak. Um, but it did identify which of those agencies have them. And, you know, if that was something that you wanted to look into, maybe we could go back to those specific agencies and ask about how that actually works. Um, and also maybe uh, find out from community members in that community how that involvement has uh, happened in practice. Um, I will say that for the matrices, or specifically here for the policy matrix, for example, I will be in communication with the wave three agencies, which are 11 agencies, um, pretty regularly to get that uh, going and, and um, get that done for this year's report. So if it was something that you wanted to focus on with wave three, we could do that. Um, or uh, doing a few agencies that you all maybe have in mind from wave one, two, or three um, to get some more information about maybe body-worn cameras and how they're used in supervised uh, supervision. Um, but that would be kind of, you know, that at your all's direction. Well, just from my perspective, I think that um, it would be more beneficial if you, if we actually survey all one, two, and three versus just picking a few different agencies. I think for me, it depends on maybe the question that's being asked and might, maybe it might vary on the different things that we go in depth on. Some might focus on the larger agencies, some might want to focus on all of them because it's easier to, the data itself is easier to collect. Um, and so it's not going to be as much of a burden on DOJ to obtain it from a larger number of agencies. Um, if we're trying to narrow down some of the questions, at least in terms of the ones that I raised, I think I'd be most interested in understanding the internal complaints, because if we're talking about accountability, that's just such a huge question. I think local jurisdictions really need to understand what's going on in their agencies and there's so much um, lack of transparency in this and I think it would also be very useful given the some degree broadening of the of transparency with respect to access to agencies records it's good it'd be good to know kind of what's actually going on in there um, in terms of what categories of things are being filed internally? Is no one ever complaining about dishonesty internally, what, despite what we know? is Are those like never getting sustained? Or are lot, is there actual lots of like sexual assault type things happening within the agency? Like, I think, I think those are important questions for the local, for in, people internally to know. Um, and I think because it's just not available a lot of places. And I think to some degree, if we're identifying jurisdictions, 
some of the larger jurisdictions may have like IG reports of things that that have touched on some of this, but the smaller jurisdictions don't really have an oversight entity that can pull that information. So unless the agency itself is voluntarily like putting it on their website, they're not going to have any insight into that. So if we're identifying agencies for that information to be disclosed to the extent there's close to that information available already through like the inspector general for a particular jurisdiction, then maybe we don't need to, to push that. But if it's not available through any other form, I think this would be a useful, um, the DOJ playing that role would be tr very helpful for the local um, advocacy organizations and communities to help get that information. And then secondly, I think finding out information on recruitment and hiring practices and their, their attempts to pull out um, explicitly biased beliefs, um, I think are, would be something that would be very difficult for any other entity to get that type of access, to get that information from these jurisdictions. So it'd be great for the DOJ to do that. To that point, okay. Melanie, um, sorry, this is Allison. Um, we, we do plan on, as part of the post hiring and recruitment, um, delving deeper into AB 846, um, which was the bill that um, established the new evaluation systems. And so I think some of the hiring and recruitment, um, and, you know, and working with POST on that. And so some of those issues, especially since that was just passed and, and just goes into effect, um, because they're going to be figuring out this process this year, um, it might be helpful to look at that um, as part of that, you know, question within that subcommittee, and then perhaps once it's established, then look at how agencies are implementing it um, as a thought, just to try to narrow down what this subcommittee is going to focus on. If I may, I would just add that, um, as Board Member Raphael said, maybe there are ways that uh, the different sort of subcommittees can work together to amplify some of these things. So. I know that with post, um, the post subcommittee on um, the bill, we'll be looking more at specifically what post is doing. But I think, and Melanie, please, uh, sorry, board member Ochoa, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like what you are speaking to is maybe specifically how agencies are, are doing their recruitment and hiring to look or pull out folks who have these biased, um, you know, ways that they may already be using or that they already do. And, and we know we hear from post all the time saying that they don't do recruitment and hiring, that it's very agency specific. So this may be a way to sort of get at two different um, angles to the same issue. If that is what the subcommittee would like to do. Yeah, that, I think both are great. Like I would love to see what is existing, what's currently going on. And then I would love to see once there's an actual you know, statutory requirement, like how are they fulfilling that and how are they complying with those like regulations? So I, I think now and in the future would be useful um, for the subcommittee to address it to some degree, but I, I would love to also see that in the hiring and practice subcommittee as well. Okay, so I know that we have a little bit of time or maybe no more time. Well, I just wanted to flag um, talking about the matrix as well, since that's an issue that may play into time and resources as well. Um, so just wanted to flag that um, before we get to the next topic. Yes, I just want to ask one more sort of question. So I know, Melanie, you've, you've um, shared that the internal um, reporting and recruitment and hiring are some of your two focus areas. And I know the, um, uh, for the uh, board member Espinosa and others have shared sort of um, items that they want to look at. So I, I would think, you know, we have two right now, but I want to make sure that we, um, I guess that the subcommittee is sort of in agreement or there's another if we want to add to that um, to think about what we're going to look at moving forward. I just want to make sure I, I get everybody's thoughts before we move on. I would just second the internal benchmarking issue, and that's it. And it's all all in the same Valley Wiccan. Um, might be useful. I can send references for that as well. That would be very helpful. Okay. 
I take that that one. Oh, can I just add, Steve, you mentioned that internal benchmarking, you said it was the same investigator as the, the VOD analysis. Is that, is that Ridgeway? Just so for those of us who are interested, we could try to find. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll send, I can send you I'll the papers too. That so. would be great. I'll do some digging. Thank you. Okay. And I will just say um, for board member Espino said there is also a potential that the um, civilian complaint subcommittee will want to look more into um, community accountability or community involvement specifically with civilian complaints um, if we don't get to do that on this subcommittee this year. Okay. All right. So now the second piece is about the matrix and it really it's not um, too sort of long as this section. This was kind of the more robust discussion area. But um, as I said earlier, the wave three uh, agencies, there are 11, um, but there are also a few agencies, I believe four, potentially more because one of them is a consortium um, that have decided to start reporting earlier. And so they will be reporting at the same time as wave three instead of in their wave, which is wave four. Um, I wanted to know if the subcommittee wants to include those additional agencies in the matrix review or just focus on the official wave three agencies. Um, and if you want to know what the agencies are, I can also let you know. Um, so wave three itself includes Alameda County um, Sheriff's Department, Anaheim Police Department, Fresno County um, and Kern County Sheriff, Los Angeles Airport Police Department, Riverside um, and Santa Ana. Police Department, San Francisco County, Santa Clara County, and Ventura County Sheriff's Department, and Stockton Police Department. The early adopters include Berkeley Police Department, Culver City, and Davis PD, um, and there is something called the Sonoma County Consortium, which I cannot recall right now how many agencies that includes, and if somebody from CSP is on, who knows, it would be great if you could jump in with that number, um, just so they can get an idea of how much uh, I guess, additional resources that may take. Okay, if no one from CSP can jump on, that's totally fine. Um, but I just wanna see what the board wants to do. And I just wanted to review a little bit again, what we do in the matrix um, and see if there are any changes that you all wanna make to this year, or if you do wanna do the same matrix for wave three. Um, I'm showing, I think you can see still my screen, um, I'm showing the matrix as it appears in the 2021 report um, and the items that this uh, subcommittee looks at with respect to the bias-free policing policy of an agency. Um, there are a few categories. We've separated them into two separate matrix for, matrices for just visual purposes and size on the page. Um, but we go through that, we have a visual, and then, as you may recall, we go through sort of each agency in a paragraph form, um, singling out a little bit more of the information. So, for example, the um, one of the check mark or X's is related to whether or not the policy details supervisor review um, with respect to bias free policing. And in the paragraph, we could detail more information about what that supervisory review looks like versus just providing a check mark that they have it or not. Um, and uh, so one question is, do we wanna do wave three and early adopters for the matrix? Do we wanna do the matrix this year for these agencies? Um, and third is, do we want to do um, the summary paragraph with the potential of changing them a little bit so that they're, I guess, more um, engaging to the readers, maybe separate, separating them out with um, bullet points or their own sort of little boxes um, to detail some of the information that the subcommittee finds um, would be helpful to those reading the report uh, for them to know. Well, personally, I think it's probably useful for community, interested community members to have access to, you know, information on the matrix and, and also this, you know, summary paragraph for places to start if they're interested and they're trying to dig into the policies of their agency. So I, I personally think it's a value. I don't know, I, you know, I, of course, we have to prioritize in terms of time. So I... I I mean, could you give us a sense, Dominique, of does it, 
tremendous amount of time to expand this to wave three and to the early adopters? Um, I don't think it's a tremendous amount of time, and I kind of enjoy doing this work, so I'm okay, <laughs> but it's up to you all. Um, I would say that generally, um, you know, it's not uh, a one-time sort of a few hours that I have to do. It's kind of following up with the agencies every here and now um, to remind them, hey, we need this information. Can you review this? Do you have more information on XYZ thing that the subcommittee wants to know? Um, but um, I wouldn't say that it would be a tremendous amount. The last year, wave two, I believe, was um, about the same as far as maybe like 10 to 15. I can't remember how many agencies it was. Um, I could probably just count them up here. But um, for time's sake, it would probably be comparable with just an additional, um, you know, few more agencies. And it just kind of depends on how responsive they are. So not every person that I communicate with is um, really responsive. Some are and some take the time to explain things to me that I want to understand for this review. Um, and others kind of just give me the policy and, and that's kind of it. Um, so it kind of really depends on how much engagement I get. Um, I apologize that I'll have to exit the meeting, but I will be absolutely following up with the video and to hear public comments. Um, I just wanted to add that if it, it so I'd echo, I think what was said is that if it is feasible, um, it, I think it would be valuable to include the new agencies, including if possible, the um, the sort of the early the early adopters, as you put it, and I see in the chat there's some information about um, how many that would be. It looks like there are nine in the Sonoma Consortium. I don't know if they could report out as a single and to mm -hmm. do the consortium review to do the nine. Um, I think it's when wave four comes that there'll be a real question about how to then consolidate or practically collect the this aspect of yeah. the data. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely a bigger yeah. question. And, and thank you. And sorry, that, that was the one thing I wanted to raise is, is I mean, and, and this year's decision does not, um, but obviously we will not be able to do this for all 400 plus agencies. So that's just something for the subcommittee to weigh in terms of value add. Um, if you want to finish it this year or think about something else um, in anticipation of next year. This is Melanie. I wonder if for future years we could just do the newly entering agencies and not necessarily update for past agencies. Would that be feasible? Um, yeah, that's definitely feasible. And I will say the updates particularly, um, so for example, last year we did a few updates of the Wave 1 agencies. Um, and I believe that uh, generally it was just asking, I asked specifically about the items that they did not get a check mark on and see where they're at or if they're changing anything um, in response to the board's recommendations and review. Um, we don't have to do that again this year if the board doesn't uh, want to do that. Um, but essentially it, it, it wouldn't be, a, I guess I wanna clarify that it wouldn't be me asking every single wave one and wave two agency because I only talk to those or follow up on those that um, had some kind of thing that they weren't meeting. Um, so it, it wouldn't be sort of, I would say, all 30 something, or I mean, yeah, <laughs> agencies. But if, if we don't wanna do the follow-up, we totally don't have to. To clarify, Melanie, also for future, um, we are onboarding, I think it, it'll be more than 400 agencies in the next wave. And so then it will mm -hmm. be feasible to just do the new ones because it'll be several hundred all at once. <laughs> um, so that's just a clarification for um, future years. The one um, talking about wave one and wave two, the one thing that I was interested in, and, if, and I don't know if this would be addendum or if this can be included, is um, both FPD, so Fresno Police, and Orange County, and I'm sure there's others, um, use a private corporation, so um, with a paid subscription to do a lot of these um, policies. So if we could get more information about that, um, my understanding is probably Lexapol where you pay, you know, you get you get these policies um, and seeing how Lexapol is interacting with the RIPA uh, recommendations, the RIPA data, 
Um, and if we could get some more information for the community about Lexapol, um, I think that, that that is crucial. I doubt they're the only ones um, in California that use that paid subscription. And I do think that it affects um, the policing. I want to second that. I think if if we are able to identify which agencies are using Lexapol, and I, if I understand correctly, you can purchase kind of, it's not like we've gotten the whole Lexapol policy. It's like separate sections that you can have a Lexapol policy for if there are certain categories of policies that we want to know if they have adopted the Lexapol um, policy for that particularly relate to like uses of force and bias and things like that. I think um, that would actually be tremendously helpful. I don't know if that's too time consuming, but even if they just have to self-report like which Lexapol policies they have and then just compile that into a list, that would be, I think, really helpful for a lot of the advocacy and understanding even at the state level with respect to um, the impact that Lexapol is having and some, and it's particularly where we know that there's disparity between what they're asserting state law and what we believe is actually state law, um, which is also a huge issue. Definitely. That's a great point um, that both of you have brought up. And I, I'm not sure if doing a sort of survey of that nature would be feasible this year, but it sounds like that might be a good idea for next year when we do have that large number of agencies coming on, especially because oftentimes, and I know we have some larger agencies currently that use um, Lexapol, but oftentimes it is the smaller agencies that have, you know, less time and resources to, to develop their own policies that end up using some of these um, store-bought, for lack of a better word, um, policies. Um, would that be okay if that was something we sort of tabled to do for next year, but maybe sort of introduce um, the topic in this year's report? Okay, great. Um, so, yes, we're going to do the Wave 3 um, matrix, and then we will look into sort of Lexapol and standard policies uh, next year. that sound like a fair summary of that? Okay, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleagues to discuss other sections um, that I know will also be very fruitful. So, thank you all very much for your time. Hi, and good morning. Um, my name is Kendall Nicholthwaite. I'm with the California Department of Justice. And what I will be discussing with folks today is probation and parole searches and consent searches. Um, for folks who are referencing the meeting packet, this section starts on page 17. And I'll go ahead and show my screen as well. So last year, we began through data exploration, we identified um, uh, some disparities in uh, terms of consent searches. So last year we did a data dive and we looked at consent searches and we were able to identify that 1.6% of stops, um, someone was asked consent to search and that was the sole basis of the search. And although, and Lily brought this up in, um, the stop data meeting, and I really want to make sure this is brought through to today's meeting, is although it represents a narrow window of stops, those uh, 62,000 people who have experienced that, um, that experience and that interaction with police is significant. And when we take a look at the data here, and I don't want to spend too much time on the data because really our focus here today is how do we take this data and, and make policy reforms that may reduce or eliminate that disparity? And so last year, we took a look at stopped individuals who were asked consent to search. And as you can see, there is a significant disparity in who is asked consent to search. Particularly Black and Hispanic people are asked consent to search at significantly higher rates than other perception categories for race and ethnicity. Similarly, we also looked at search discovery rates of consent searches, finding that um, those who are perceived to be Black and Hispanic actually had lower discovery rates for consent searches. And so last year, we left the board with 
the question and with the community, the question of, one, does the utility of this search outweigh the harm um, and potential harm to public and public perception, and also this disparity that we're seeing in these searches? And so with that question, we began to look at different policies, both statewide um, and individual agency policies um, that have created restrictive rules on consent searches. And so there have actually been several states, and this was in last year's report as well, that have imposed restrictive rules on consent searches. One of those is Minnesota, and that was actually in 2003 through a court ruling. Um, they were significantly limited. Uh, New Jersey, likewise, has restricted rules on consent searches. Um, interestingly, I think for this board, is that change actually began with a Senate Judiciary recommendation um, to prohibit consent searches. The board noticed a significant disparity in who was asked consent to search. And as a result, they made a recommendation to prohibit it. Um, just about a year after making that uh, recommendation, so in 2002, um, the courts in New Jersey also found that it was a discriminatory practice and absent, um, and it, this was a statewide prohibition on, on these searches. Rhode Island similarly um, passed a ban on consent searches and that was done through the legislature. Another thing we looked at was agency specific um, restrictions on consent searches. And so one of those um, was actually the California Highway Patrol. From 2001 to 2006, um, officers were restricted in asking for consent to search. And what prompted that change was um, the California Highway Patrol, Patrol, as a part of a lawsuit, um, implemented these changes after finding that a Hispanic or Latinx individuals were three times as likely to be searched and Black individuals were twice as likely to be searched than those identified as white. Now in 2006, however, CHP did uh, re-implement that practice and they are um, using consent searches presently. And then the last one we discussed last year was the Hamden Police Department. And I think some of the folks who were on the board last year um, were at the presentation where several researchers um, from Connecticut came and spoke to us about how their STOP data project helped inform changes for Hamden Police Department. And so the researchers um, identified that there was a significant disparity in who was asked consent to search. And similarly, like we were finding in the data, the discovery rates are particularly low, possibly evidencing that this is not an effective police practice. And so, um, once this change was made in the Hampton Police Department, um, search yield rate actually increased dramatically from 7% close to 80%. Um, subsequently, uh, the state of Connecticut actually passed legislation um, requiring restrictive rules on consent searches. Um, their law was more specific to stops of vehicles, uh, similarly to CHP. So if it's a stop of a vehicle, um, you cannot conduct a search of the motor vehicle simply by asking consent to search. Um, the officers have to engage in evidence gathering and evidence-based searches. So this is one area the board wanted to look into for potential policy reforms. And I, I'm gonna review probation searches, but a few questions that we want the board to consider moving forward is what are we going to do with this data? What do we want to do policy-wise with something like consent searches? Are we at a place where we want to explore some model policies and potentially start making recommendations on those? Are we at a place where potentially we could be asking for best practices recommendations? So ultimately, this is what I hope to kind of facilitate in our discussion today. 
is what is our vision moving forward after identifying this disparity? So the other uh, section I wanted to talk to folks about today are probation and parole searches. I'm gonna go ahead and scroll forward, so I apologize. Um, this is on page 20 of the meeting packet. Similarly, um, in the 2019 data, we saw 0.7% of stops where the primary reason of the stop was the person is known to be on probation or parole. And we also identified 96,000 individuals were searched due to their supervision status. So this is another area where we're looking at potentially a, a smaller area of policing, but a significant impact to the individuals who are asked if they are on probation and parole. And I wanna bring through to this meeting something um, Chief Swing brought up in our stop data meeting is when we are looking at these probation and parole statistics, we do also have to look at this in the larger picture of mass incarceration and our judicial system, which has produced inequities. And so a question for the board here is, given the inequities in our justice system, and given these inequities that we see here and who is asked consent to search and who is asked if they're on probation and parole, is this a practice that we should continue? And so just wanted to highlight again, the data from last year that has really driven us to this point um, in both figure 34 and 35 here. These are folks who are stopped, who are known to be on supervision. You see those who are back are asked um, or stopped at a significantly higher rates than any other perceived race or ethnicity count. Similarly, um, those who are searched, again, we notice a significant disparity here, and those who are searched for a condition of supervision. So we started to look into policies here um, of restrictions on asking who's on probation or parole. Um, there are several agencies that have actually implemented uh, restrictions on just simply asking if someone's on probation or parole. One of those notably is the Oakland Police Department. Um, in Oakland, they have restricted rules on this. Um, officers can't simply walk up and inquire about someone's supervised release status. In fact, uh, in the policy, at the beginning of an interaction without proper justification, is unjust. Let me just say that again. At the beginning of an interaction, without proper justification, it is unjust. And so to that end, officers cannot immediately inquire whether someone's on supervised release unless there's an immediate threat to officer safety. The Oakham policy does go a step further and saying that if the su someone's on supervised release for a nonviolent offense, absent connection to criminal activity or threat to the officer, a warrantless search condition shall not be invoked. So the Oakland policy does not only limit inquiries of who's on probation or parole, it also restricts probation and parole searches uh, for nonviolent offenses. So if someone's on probation for a, a petty theft, for example, an officer may have to form an evidence-based search as opposed to a search based on a supervised condition. San Diego also similarly has a restricted policy on asking consent to search. Um, and theirs, um, they open with saying, asking about a, pro a person's probation or parole status and previous arrests can be interpreted as unmerited and in some circumstances, even discriminatory. And so the policy specifically says, during the course of citizen contacts, officers should not ask about the person's probation and parole status or other legally documented status unless the officer has independent knowledge of that person's criminal history. And so these are two areas that the board um, wanted to look into for policy reforms. And the board here is tasked with, with the weighty obligation to our community of reducing and eliminating 
racial and identity profiling. Here we have two areas where we have significant disparities in our data. And the question for the subcommittee and ultimately for the board is what are we going to do now when it comes to policy reform? Does the board want to look more at model policies, best practices recommendations, or maybe there's some additional evidence or data we can use to inform that policy recommendation. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to turn it to the board, and I'm really excited to get folks in path. I'm happy to start since I know a part of this is some some issues that I raised last year. And I absolutely feel that we are at the point where we can be recommending that um, agencies no longer engage in consent searches. Um, I'm happy to do whatever other steps need to be done to, to or like other research that we want to include in the report on that. But I think it's the evidence to me is and the impact is clear on what is happening with those consent searches, and I think that is within our mandate to try to um, recommend actual policies that will result in um, and practices that will result in the lessening of these uh, negative impacts for communities. Um, so I'm definitely in favor of that. I'm I'm interested on the probation um, and parole inquiries whether if you guys looked at the Oakland and San Diego data to see if there was a meaningful difference in the, how those agencies, those agencies, the, off, the conduct of the officers in those agencies to, to better I understand whether the policies they put forth are actually sufficient to stop that, the practices that were, are flagged obviously as um, sources of bias um, because if they're if they're still doing similar, you know, reflecting similar patterns as other agencies, then it suggests that a policy like these are is not enough to get the officers to change their um, practices, and, and maybe there's something that needs to be more um, categorical even than that than what is written here, or more exclusion. Uh, it's um, put even stronger limits on their ability to make these inquiries or conduct these searches than is recommended here. Um, so I'd be interested in see, to see that because I know, I mean, what's on paper and what officers do is not always um, consistent. So I wanna make sure that this, it looks good, but is it actually sufficient to achieve the ends that we're looking for? Um, so to the extent that DOJ might have sufficient data to do that analysis, that would be useful to see if there's something, an actual difference here. Um, and to some degree, and I know this was something that was raised, and I have not personally looked at the data, but it was raised by a public comment previously about disparities in the Oakland PD data that's reported to RIPA and their internally reported stop data, um, which was more, which was, expressed by the in the public comment as being um, more ref reflective of more stops and more racially more racially biased stops uh, or more racial disparities in stops as well than was reported to RIPA. I don't know if that's accurate, but to the extent there's other data that can be used maybe in conducting that analysis, we may want to look into that um, to see kind of maybe under RIPA data that's showing the difference because they're not reporting, but maybe under these other reporting requirement, they're actually not um, showing a difference in terms of how officers are responding to supervisory stuff. Yeah, that's certainly something we can look into. We have not pulled data specifically on San Diego and Oakland, so that's certainly something I think that's within our grasps for doing this year um, and may inform us moving forward when it comes to these policy recommendations. had a very, very uh, similar reaction to Melanie about the the Oakland and San Diego policy change. It was interesting to see that those existed because um, I think that's a, a big change in policy, at least official stated policy relative to what what is common in agencies across the country or across the state. But I, I would be really curious to see whether um, you see a you see a shift 
both in terms of um, just the overall disparity in searches, uh, and then also, you know, the outcomes of searches, right? It, what I've seen in, in research in um, both RIPA data and then individual agencies is that a lot of times those searches are not that productive. Uh, and, and so it would, I'd be curious to see what the effect of these policies are if they're impacting practice on the ground and if they're moving needles. To that point, one additional thing, if, do we know when the San Diego and Oakland policies were enacted? One was 2014 and the other 2019. Is that what it said on there? Okay. San Diego was earlier. Okay. So, so Oakland is in 2019. I don't know where. You, yeah. Is that right? Is that correct? So we put for Oakland, at least we would have both comparison to other agencies in to for 2019, 2020, but also 2018 versus 2019 as to see if there's a difference in um, practices. And I should say, under, under, while I would like to see how this, how effective these policies have been, I absolutely would endorse a policy that limited the searches. It's the question of, do they, is it sufficient? And what is, um, what, is, what, is, what is a good policy? Look like? What's the effect, yeah. I second all of that um, in terms of the recommendation and fit effect. I also think it kind of goes back to um, what what we consider easily accessible. And I know like the uh, in terms of like policy shifts and what policies are for uh, the police where it's online, but I think that in and of itself is an accessibility issue. So in terms of recommendations, um, if it includes when there is policy shifts and informing the community and how they inform the community of this, because civilians may not know that that in of itself triggers a civilian complaint because it's a policy uh, versus just calling for what the what people think of like you know I was beat up I was excessive force like what the civilian complaints really are um, so making sure that easily accessible doesn't just mean that it's posted online and I think that goes back to the meaningfulness and making sure that people know that this is something you should be um, aware of and be able to complain about and you know is enforceable. So moving forward with this section, I know we want to look at the data and refine the probation and parole and specifically looking at both Oakland and San Diego. Um, and it seems like this subcommittee is also interested in regarding restrictive or limiting consent searches. I just want to make sure I, I'm understanding that correctly. It looks like I'm getting a lot of nods. So moving forward, um, do we want to propose potentially model language when it comes to consent searches for policy or um, more kind of broader in recommending that individual agencies look at implementing policies restricting consent? I think to make it easiest for agencies to actually adopt, it'd be good to have model language. Um, I was going to say model as well. We can certainly work on that. And I can see also moving towards, I see where we're moving towards more model language, but I also think that it also warrants further examination, looking at, um, especially with some of the, maybe some of the specialized task force and different people and looking at, clearly looking at Oakland and San Diego, but also looking at some of the, getting some more information from people who kind of like how it's used and how it's, you know, how it's actually being used. So I think getting some perspective from them would be valuable as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate your feedback on that. Um, are there any more comments regarding both the probation and parole and consent searches? And if not, I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of my colleagues to discuss our, our next topic. 
Okay, hearing none, I'm going to turn it over to Anna. Morning, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Rick. I'm, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a AGPA with the Civil Rights Enforcement Section, and I'm really glad that you're here today. Um, I am going to share my screen. The topic on the agenda that I want to discuss um, is why the subcommittee may want to consider making policy recommendations to address gender disparities in stop data now. The stop data analyzed in the 2021 RIPA board report showed disparities across gender, particularly for people that officers perceive to be transgender. On Tuesday of this week, the Stop Data Analysis Subcommittee reviewed these findings, along with some of the findings from the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, the largest survey examining the experiences of transgender people in the U.S., which included questions about experiences with police and other law enforcement officers. One of the survey findings was that 72% of American Indian and 70% of Black respondents who interacted with law enforcement in the previous year reported never or only sometimes being treated with respect by law enforcement. I won't present the data in detail today, but I'm sharing slides so that you can view some of the findings while we discuss policies. Links to the data are provided in section A of page 29 of the meeting materials. In addition to observing disparities in the RIPA data and in review of literature, the Cress RIPA team has observed recent policy changes as of this month in the state of New York aimed at eliminating the profiling of transgender women. An article about the policy change is included on pages 32 to 33 of the meeting materials. Furthermore, in 2019, the National Center for Transgender Equality published model language for police department policies developed by the National LGBTQ HIV Criminal Justice Working Group with participation from the organizations in this slide. Let me get to that slide. Model policies were previously included in the US DOJ's Office of Community Oriented Policing Services 2017 report Gender, Sexuality, and 21st Century Reporting, Policing. In addition to the published model policy, in 2019, the National Center for Transgender Equality reviewed the policies of the 25 largest police departments in the country and graded them on 17 criteria reflecting areas of interaction between law enforcement and transgender people. The review included Los Angeles PD, San Diego PD, and San Francisco PD. A link to the report is provided on page 29 in the second paragraph of section B of the meeting materials. The subcommittee may want to consider developing policy recommendations aimed at eliminating the pro profiling of transgender people. The model policy included on pages 34 through 47 of the meeting materials might serve as a resource for the subcommittee to consider policies that you'd like to recommend. Policies of interest could be further researched and discussed. The subcommittee may wish to request a presentation from a research institute 
or an advocacy organization with expertise or may request that DOJ staff consult with a subject matter expert. I'm going to pull up the meeting packet. Um, so I'm briefly going to review some of the content of the model policy. Um, model policy number two directly relates to profiling. It also includes policy regarding searches and harassment. Item number four in the model includes a best practice for non-binary recognition. Model language on non-binary identity is included in the model policy on use of respectful language, department forms and records, search procedures and training. Model policy number seven addresses search procedures. Model policy number nine addresses officer sexual misconduct. Model policy number 14 addresses the use of condoms as evidence. Best practice recommendations in item 15 address training on policies and search and seizure training. And lastly, best practices recommendations in items 16 and 17 address immigration enforcement cooperation and civilian oversight. This is a resource that I wanted to bring to the attention of the subcommittee um, and welcome your feedback on how you may want to proceed this year. So I'll just say that I, this is Melanie Ochoa, um, that I'm, I'm glad that this is going to be, why well, I, I don't know if it's decided already, but I would love for this to be a subject for a focus for this year's report because the disparities along gender identity really is something that jumped out um, of last year's report and I'd love to engage more um, in recommendations specifically to address those. Um, in terms of there are a few different next steps that you recommended or you know, proposed as options in terms of how we've approached other like diving into other kind of questions or other categories of recommendations, what has been kind of the most effective way of taking that next step? Was it reporting back to the board? Was it engaging an expert, um, like you mentioned before? Or like, which of these options do you think is kind of the best, given the stat, the existing research that's out there, and how much we can actually identify kind of what the what types of practices are driving these harms? And Allison or Nancy had, and board members that may have been involved, I think everyone is newer in the development of the model bias free policing policy um, that the board recommended um, could speak to how that was developed in the process. I can speak a little bit to that. So, for example, when um, the board was interested in model um, language for uh, bias-free policing policies. Um, we conducted research on, you know, what the best practices were and what other agencies, um, especially agencies who had been under 
um, some sort of uh, supervision or consent decree, either with the federal government or um, Cal DOJ. Um, and so it was, uh, for those, it was a matter of the research and gathering information and then figuring out what the categories were um, that the subcommittee and the board wanted to focus on. And then from there offering different um, policy language that, um, because I think there are two ways to go. There, there is, you know, an idea of adopting a model policy and then there's an idea of model language and often um, and Commissioner Ray can perhaps confirm this, but you know, usually it's helpful to include language and then agencies can then adopt it for themselves based on you know, their own circumstances um, and what they already have in their policies. Um, but you know, in this case, there is also a, a sample model policy. So the subcommittee can also look at um, what that is and decide to pull out pieces that they'd like to include. Um, you know, it's really, I think we've developed things in different ways um, with the complaints. It was also looking at best practices and talking with um, experts uh, on some of those issues. So we can either bring an expert to the subcommittee or we can at DOJ consult experts um, and then present to you sort of, th that's how we came up with, for example, the accountability topics was getting ideas from the subcommittee talking to policing experts and then developing categories um, that the subcommittee then approved to sort of move forward with. Um, and so it may be a matter of different, you know, developing different categories. Um, so it, we, we've sort of done it in a variety of ways and I think it's really up to the subcommittee on what you think would be most um, helpful for all of you um, on these topic areas. And yes, and I, I was I was listening. I was trying to find the best way to see how we would be able to uh, this, make this information helpful for everyone. I think you nailed it on with the language because that's what I was sitting here thinking. I said this language, and as I went through the report, the uh, model report policy is incorporated in so many different areas um, of our policies already. You know, in the EEO policy and those things. But I I could really see some value in our and some of the training and this being added to our cultural diversity training in our particular department and probably incorporating some of those topics and different things into scenarios and things that where people can learn and can move forward. So I do see where there is a lot of policy that is covered, but um, maybe when we develop language or a specific language that we want to ensure that everyone is incorporating into their policies. But I think that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of my take on it, is just that, that if there's language that we see that um, we would want to make sure and ensure that everyone has it, and even maybe look at what best practices are out there and see where people are already incorporating these ideas. And, you know. I, I agree with all that. Um, I think it would be helpful to hear from, from an expert or, or someone who has very deep knowledge on this topic. Uh, you know, so and then we can ask questions and 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 think a little bit think a, bit, a little bit about it more deeply. I agree with that as well. I think that would be great. I think a, a question that I have for the subcommittee, and not necessarily for you to answer in this moment, but uh, when we reach out to an expert, if that's the subcommittee's recommendation. It might be helpful to be able to share with them if there are any um, best practices language or model policies that, that you've looked at that you're particularly interested in them speaking to. Um, it also, Anna, thank you for the first. Oh. Oh, sorry, Anna. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Uh, one thing that came to mind in terms of your question of bringing an expert, um, I think one of the things that would be helpful to hear from them is where have they seen either the modern policy incorporated, where have they, um, if they know of some jurisdictions 
where people have felt accepted, have felt respected. I know there's like a good percentage here. I feel like an expert would know that more in addition to just the model policy might be able to answer of how that is in practice, right? So just from their experience um, of knowing how this plays out. So I would be um, interested in knowing that. And I would also maybe to the, to the extent it's evident where which policies would connect to the types of disparities that we were that were most evident in the data that would also be something that i would to the extent we focus on things i would like to um, that could be a, a way that we identify this the areas to focus on i agree that that would be very helpful and i think that um this work this year will be kind of cross um there will be cross-learning between the STOP Data subcommittee looking at these issues and the policy subcommittee. Um, is there anything further? The only other, um, Anna, you have on here, and I don't know if this is something to talk about later, if I jumped, um, the other possible areas for future analysis, you have those two about calls for service for social services systems and then the consequences for women who are caregivers for the calls for service. So I don't know if that's something that we should talk about now or after we've talked about um, this current issue. No, I think the subcommittee can, uh, continue to discuss um, gender analysis of stop data and gender disparities in interaction with law enforcement more broadly. Um, we do have the data showing the disparities on um, law enforcement interaction with transgender people through, through RIPA, um, published in the 2021 report. So that might be something that the subcommittee would like to take action on this year, but I do think it's valuable to discuss more broadly um, the gender analysis that the subcommittee would like to do. Yeah, yeah I'm interested in the, um, and I don't, like I said, if there's time this year or another year, but to put it on our radar, these potential areas for future analysis as well. Um, be a data collection, if it's possible to get data collection through the family regulation system for social services providers um, and how law enforcement is involved. Um, social service providers sometimes also be including like medical facilities, hospitals that are now um, calling the police when we have, you know, um, substance use disorders for women um, and pregnant bodies. Um, things like that and getting that data collection as part of that law enforcement um, um, information that RIP is going to be looking at and the disparities in race, especially for black and brown women um, when it comes to these uh, police interactions through social services, through medical providers, and through the family regulation system. Anna. Thank you, Chair Espinosa. Are there any uh, other comments from board members? All right. Thank you for all of your feedback. Thank you, DOJ, and I think now we're at public comment. So we'll go ahead and take it to public comment and we'll go by region, um, starting with NorCal. Is there anybody who is in NorCal that wants to give a public comment? Go ahead and unmute yourself um, and you're invited if you want to, to unvideo yourself as well. Hi, oh, someone else wanna go first? Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. 
Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is John Stoller. I'm a public defender in Sacramento County. I have a question I'm very curious on is how are you going to intersect this data with the recently passed Racial Justice Act and will you make it available to uh, litigators in any sense? Like the actual raw data and is there anything like in the works for like a tool to go county by county to help create like a database? Thank you for your question. Um, I can turn that either. Maybe does the DOJ want to respond to that in terms of the community input that they're doing? Um, I know that they've been doing a lot of making sure that the community has got the data. Hmm. Maybe I, I we can see that. that. Any anybody else from NorCal? Central Valley? and um, Southern California. Um, yes, um, my name is, is Ernest Davis. Um, um, so, so I live in, in, in uh, San Diego and, and, um, and I, I have a, uh, a suggestion to um, um, help with the um, problem of Racial uh, profiling. Um, um, uh, um, um, I would um, um, have um, uh, black uh, law enforcement officers um, um, to. Uh, um, be the um, senior officer at a uh, random traffic um, stop or, or jaywalking uh, stop. And if a black police officer uh, isn't uh, um, there, then um, uh, the engaging um, officer should be um, required to, um, to um, call a, 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 a um, black officer and, and, and um, these uh, black um, officers should have, have, have monthly training in in a DS uh, a DS collation and 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 I think uh, 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 that would um help. Thank you for your comment. Anybody, You're welcome. Anybody else from Southern California? I would like to speak. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. I have uh, four quick points. The first one is about misconduct complaints. And I note on, I believe it's page six of the new report, which is a really powerful report. Thank you for all your fierce work on that. Um, but I know that there are 75% of the racial profiling and identity profiling complaints that are unfounded. And unfounded means, quote, clearly found allegation not to be true. So there's something going on there. Otherwise, we're saying, you know, three out of four of the folks that actually get up enough courage to file a complaint uh, are found to have their complaint be not true, not even investigated, but actually not true. Um, with your hiring and recruitment uh, discussion, it's not just about who is hired and recruited, it is who is retained, who's feel, who feels comfortable staying in the agency that they have joined. There's the issue of people self-selecting out, leaving after two or three years, you could research that. You might wanna think about cluster hires 
which are a way to bring in officers of color and provide them with a group of folks who are supported uh, with them so they're not a single officer or one uh, of a few officers of color. My third point very quickly is the Lexapol issue. I've talked about this a bit with y'all before, but Lexapol is, um, I'll just say it in street talk, it's by law enforcement for law enforcement. Using template policies by, by Lexapol is actually counter to what RIPA was born to do. In, in my understanding. And then the last point very quickly is I would, um, in, in all due respect, caution using the terms utility and efficiency when talking about consent searches because it opens up the door to violations of the 14th Amendment uh, because if you are finding contraband with a particular group at higher rates, then you're on some level saying it makes sense that law enforcement go after those folks, even though I know your data is telling us it's actually the reverse, uh, if you're tracking on that. But thank you for your, for your work. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else from Southern California? Hi, this is Ann Barron from San Diego. Oh, Ann. And so I had two questions. Uh, one is concerning youth. Um, we have in.